Welcome to Never No Moment. I'm Greg Blythe, and you're about to witness an interview I had with Kevin Kent. It was awesome. It was two guys cutting up, and we talk a lot about his personal life beyond the knife, as well as what's going on in the knife world. And we have some great um, revelations from him, some insight on some, some new things going on. So I'm excited to share that with you. I do want to first apologize. The format that I recorded on the Zoom meeting did not split the screen. We are not side by side. I was unaware of it. There's no way I can change it. So it's in participants view, which means whoever's speaking is who you see. So the video will shoot back and forth from us. It's not my favorite, so I do apologize. We did cut the two hour interview into two sections, one um, tonight and then one next week we'll, we'll release part two. And I also wanna point out that we are launching uh, our merchandise store. There'll be a link in the description. Um, our merchandise has some adaptations of some logos that you've seen before. We have our own brand um, listed on the site, as well as we have brands that you know, Real Sharp Knife, Perfect Edge Cutlery, um, CJA Edged Art. We have, um, <clears throat> let's see who do we, we have, uh, Scott Gunn. Um, we have Fuku Knives, we have Tokushu Knife. I'm just trying to make sure I got everybody in there. We have some some funny designs you've heard of, like you know, like uh, sh sharp knives matter, dull knives splatter, um, straight out of Takafu. Um, definitely some fun knife humor stuff that I know you're going to enjoy. Also, I just want you to know that in the you'll see a lot of merchandise. You might first see the men's shirt. We do have the female counterpart available, so just check through the site for that. We appreciate you checking in with us. And now I want you to enjoy the interview with Kevin Kent from Knifeware. Thank you, guys. Welcome to Never Dull Moment. I'm Greg Blythe, and I know today's not going to be a dull moment. Today we have someone I look up to. I'm sure if you're a knife nerd, you look up to. Uh, we have Kevin Kent with us from Knifeware. He's been kind enough to take some time out of his day and uh, answer some of the questions. I did a poll out there and asked you guys to send me some questions to ask him. I'm glad that I have the opportunity. He is coming to us from Calgary today. He's a couple of hours back. And um, so, first of all, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me, man. Appreciate you there. Um, I know we, we both said we were gonna enjoy a nice cocktail today, so I, I can take the edge off. Um, there you go. So, I think first of all, my I, I follow you on Instagram. For those of you guys who don't know on Instagram, if you follow him, we have Knife Nerd. He is the original that I'm aware of. And um, if you, we follow you on Instagram, we see a life behind the knife. And no one really is ever asking you in interviews about that side of your life. So I definitely wanted to pause real quick and just say, like, I see camping. I see a vintage Mustang. I see a bicycle. So what does go on in your life beyond the knife? Right now? Go? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. But, you know, <laughs> is, is, is there woods in your backyard? I mean, do you literally just go camping or you, you, well, you know what I live, I live in Calgary. So we're, uh, we're a bit like uh, Denver in the way that we're, I think a thousand meters elevation here. we got the, we have the mountains, the Rocky mountains, just uh, oh, from my door, 45 minute drive, I suppose. Okay. So I get out there quite a bit. We've got uh, we've got a great trout river that runs through our town. I've never we've got excellent bike paths. So I try to take advantage of all those things, you know. Okay. So does that mean you're you you have to be operationally like in the store day to day? Do you know what? When we had one shop or two shops or even three shops, I was in the shops all day, right? That was my job. Yeah. But we've got what have we got now? Eight stores now? So my job, my, my, my job's changed quite a bit. I, uh, I get to, I get to do all the really fun stuff like oh, this yeah. and all the really bad stuff like lawyers and accountants and landlords. <laughs> I, I understand. I, I run um, an internet business. I run, I'm a hair, so I'm a hairdresser. My wife and I have our own business 33 years. So, so we have to do those things as well. <clears throat> so I have a list of questions that the viewers have done. They are all over the place. So I, I kind of started off with some light stuff to go and get into the nice stuff. 
So definitely someone wants to know, do you make sushi? <laughs> Badly. You know? With okay. lots of enthusiasm, but medium skill. Okay. It just, the ingredients make it to the mouth. Yeah, and that's important. You know, what? I, you know, the problem is, the problem is I've been a chef for a long time. Yes. I've got a really good resume for being a cook. Like I've worked at some nice joints, right? So yeah. I, I understand the difference between a restaurant, a restaurant, and a, the ones you read about in the international magazines. Yeah. Like I know our mission is on at that level, right? <laughs> so, and I also have eaten sushi. Like if you, Fujiwara san, if you ever are lucky enough to get him to take you to his I was gonna say, you're sushi insane. joint, you the real deal. So when you say, do I make sushi? Well, I make things that look like sushi right because i know like I, like i said i've eaten some of the finest sushi i think going so i i i get what the good good like i get it i'm not making that i'm making better than grocery store sushi <laughs> well, you know talking about you in restaurants i i wasn't planning on mentioning this but i do want to mention that you guys really did a lot to support the people who are out of work in the restaurant business um mm. offering sharpening for people in the restaurant business, and that was correct. Yeah, so you know, every, this has been a funny year, right? There's this whole pandemic thing going on. You might have heard about it. Yeah, you and know, I, it's been in the news a little bit. You made the news, did it? <laughs> sometimes, so, I, sometimes. This is my haircut. Normally, I've got very short hair. <laughs> well, and I don't. So where I live in America, like I said, my kids live there, and I know it's more shut down where I live. We are mask free. I'm not trying to go and politically and like whatever, but we are mask free here. So people come in the salon. We don't wear a mask at work. People come in the salon. You have your option. Nobody gives you a hard time for wearing. If, more if I have a client who has um, maybe their son has cancer and they want to risk it, they'll ask me and I'll do it out of courtesy. Just yep. being a polite person. It's not required, but you, you can go in the store and see in and out. Nobody bothers each other. You know, everyone has their reasons. No one's going to question like what you're doing, but I understand that. Um, my children haven't been able to eat out in a nice restaurant. They just went Saturday for the yep. first time to celebrate birthdays. So the restaurant business there is just starting and they needed you. We're happy that you were helping them. Yeah, each each province has different rules, right? Yeah. Just like the states, have different, each state has different rules. But basically, um, restaurants, indoor dining restaurants in, in most areas in Canada has been shut down for a while, right? So I'm sure they're glad, and, sure they're glad to be working and get their knives sharpened. And yeah, so that's what we did. So we did because we're a bunch. Like, my company is is you know starting with me, but we've got fifty some employees, and I'll bet up the fifty some. I bet twenty five used to be cooks. Yeah, cooks or chefs, right? So we feel like they're one of us. Like we feel one yeah. with that industry, and we just we so like, restaurants have been yo-yoed around so badly in this yeah. pandemic here in Canada. They've really been yo-yoed around, open, close, open, close. And then the chefs, of course, have just been getting, well, nothing, right? They just, it's, it's been rough for them. So we just thought, okay, this last closure, let's just do free knife sharpening for chefs that have had their restaurants closed. Just bring in your stuff. We'll do all of it for free. Like, don't worry about it. And yeah, we ended up doing thousands of knives at each store. Well, I'm just great. great right? It's that. just, it's just because we were trying to figure out what can we do to give back a little bit to our, yes, you're, to our industry, right? Well, it's funny. I almost thought about doing that, and I'm like, could I be some guy in my mall volunteering? And I'm like, thousands of people come up. And I'm like, it's just me. Um, so yeah, luckily, luckily, we got staff that help out. I can't do thousands a day. No, <laughs> um, I can barely do. I mean, I've done twenty, but my neck was killing me. Um, so you were talking about the 50 people that worked for you. Uh, one of the questions is, how did you derive this Motley crew? Because I see you guys kidding and cutting up and everything. And I've read the bios at the locations, not all of them, but, but you do have, uh, um, you know, men, women of every kind. Like, how did you end up with this crew? Um, so a friend said, Hey, can my buddy come work here? Or, you know, well, you know, we, we, we get good people. We, <sighs> I think we offer a job that's a bit different than most people want or have had before, to be honest, right? Yeah. So when we started 14 years ago, I thought, I, I want to make retail better. I want to make it different because I always thought staffing would be a huge issue, yes. right? Because I, coming from a restaurant industry, I know that keeping staff's hard sometimes. So we thought, okay, what can we do? So I thought, well, let's, for sure, let's have really good staff Christmas parties. 
That's yeah. always to that. Let's drink champagne on people's birthdays. Love it. Let's bring champagne. Let's drink champagne on New Year's Eve and Christmas Eve. Let's drink champagne. I like champagne. This showing, isn't it? Let's drink okay. champagne. On I want to ask you one question real quick. I got a dog just extremely loud. Are you hearing the sounds of the dog chewing on a bone? No. Okay. I just want to know if the viewers are going to be annoyed by that sound. I haven't heard. Have you heard my fan? Because I've got a fan blowing on me because it's oh, but a I have degrees enjoyed here. the Mariah Carey effect. Yeah, I, I'm getting that sometimes. Look at this. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I have it. So you're a lover of champagne. We heard that. Oh. Champagnes are grapes that know somebody. So they know you. And that's uh so yeah, so we just we thought, okay, how can we make retail a career for people rather than just a stopping point? Like rather than just a place where people show up to get a paycheck and go mm -hmm. home. Well, you're you're offering the Tiffany of your industry. I mean, yeah, but still, like, have you been to a knife shop before? <laughs> so I'm like 15 in the, years ago. Now, listen, the moment that I'm able to not pay fifteen hundred dollars a day of quarantine to get back to Canada, I will be there to hug my son, and I will be in your store, and I'll be happy to meet everyone. But I have to book the three days quarantine to get into Canada, and yep. you have to book the you know it's fifteen hundred dollars per day, forty five hundred plus the ticket. And then I have to miss three more days of work while I'm living in the hunt. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get to see your store yet. That's fine. But I will definitely be when I've been around, we've been around for 14 years. We plan on being around for at least six more months. Okay. At least. I, I've been <laughs> I'm open up my room. Um so some other questions would be with your entire life having knife everywhere, does the other does the rest of your family have this love affair with knives that you do? Or they stick of it. My mom has a knife that she likes. Right. I got her a 150 mil Kumo, Masakagi Kumo. But I got I got Andrew, had Anderson make it a little bit taller, more like a 150 Guto. So she uses that. She likes it. She doesn't really care. Wife. My wife is my wife has two knives that she likes, but she'll grab whatever's close. Completely uninterested. <laughs> Did she grab any of your collection and just she knows which one she's allowed to touch. <laughs> we, so we have a drawer in the island of all of my knives. They've actually exceeded the drawer, so someone in the hall closet. And so then we have this separate thing that they, but the family is allowed to use, uh, I'm going to say some words wrong, and I am welcome you correcting me. Yoshikane? Yoshikani. Yoshikani, SKD. Tashimi 180 millimeter Santoku. Yep. And, and and everyone also loves the camo. Camo, camo. Camo. Camo 180 millimeter Bunka pie cutlery custom handle Damascus R2 steel. That uh, is that Shiro Camo from Shiro Takafu camo. or okay. Shiro camo. There's two there's two camos at Takafu. Okay, so we got the Shiro Camo <clears throat> and it's a R2 Damascus. So they're not gonna mess it up with it, you know, cut a lemon and walk away. Yeah. So and it's 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 a great knife. Love that knife. Honestly, it caught me off guard. I was just like, damn, I can't believe how much I like this knife. It was one of my late, like later purchases that jumped up to the the front. Right. Um Okay, so the, everybody, so they don't like love knives. They use them, but they don't like, they're like tired of it. It's all day. My nephew, my nephew's 14, 15 now. He saved, he say he, he got a job at the local farmer's market and saved his money and then came to my store in Calgary. So he's, he's out in Vancouver Island. So he came to Calgary and he brought his money and said, I want to buy a knife from me. <laughs> so awesome. he got, he got a 150 Petty um a uh kobayashi r2 the red pack of handles man it's such a great little blade oh it's funny because it's one of the blacksmiths i don't own but it's on the list on the oh list. kobayashi his, he's not a blacksmith he's a sharpener okay right Why but his knives he's, he's good man because his his big business is sharpening thousands and thousands and thousands of knives a day with a huge machine that are from a Korean company. They send him all these blanks. He sharpens them up, sends them back. That's his big job, right? That's, That's what it pays the bills. Sorry? That's Vietnamese. I was thinking of the Vietnamese company. But, no, um, no, it's it's mass production. Okay. 
something from and that's and that's his that's his bread and butter right that pays the bills keeps the lights on buys him a car that sort of thing what he really loves is he's buying blanks from different japanese blacksmiths grinds them sharpens polishes handles and that's and that's his passion right and i always remember we were talking i was saying that uh you were saying you were going to go to the Seki Knife Show this year, if they have it. Well, not I, this year, but next September. <clears throat> I know that they canceled this year. Yeah, I, I don't think they're going to have it this year. Yeah, no. The last one they were going to have was in 2019, and I was I was in Seki for that, but it got canceled because they were having a huge typhoon coming. Yeah. And I was with Kobayashi there and Shibata-san and Ikeda-san, and we, uh, we just hung out in a gyoza bar for the – Worst part of the typhoon and drank sake and ate gyoza. <laughs> so your Japanese is just amazing. <clears throat> garbage. Garbage. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Takes me, you know what? If I was a smart person, if I was good at my classes, if I if I paid attention, if I had skills, I'd be speaking Japanese by now. <clears throat> this conversation is impossible. I can get by very basically if I have to. I know. Uh, I but it takes it takes about two weeks of me being in Japan before my brain gets properly turned on to Japanese again. And well, by I, then I'm leaving. I love that culture. And I, I did know more than I knew. But um so questions that we go on, what is your favorite steel? You have a big collection, you have something you love, what's your favorite? I'm a super blue. I've I've got hundreds of knives, you know. Um top three. My first my first really my first Japanese blade that I really fell in love with was SRS 15. Okay. So I think I'll always have a soft spot for that. It's hard to sharpen, but when you get it right, wow, does it okay. sing, man. I don't own So I think, I think I'm going to pick that because that was like the, my first love. But you know what? Algami Super, made by the right blacksmiths, outstanding. Algami Super is good because it's quite forgiving as well. I, I a agree. lot of blacksmiths can make it, and it's really good no matter really who makes it. Um, Shirogami, like number one or two, the white yeah. steels, those are interesting to a lot of the blacksmiths because you have to have a lot more skills, right? You really have to understand what you're doing to make it great. And when they do, it's like, whoa, right? Like, I'm never going to tell Hinura San that he uses the wrong steel because you use one of Hinura San's knives. You're, it's going to blow your mind, right? Okay. Well, I haven't had a chance. I had a chance to buy one. And, <laughs> so and hard. <laughs> I, I, I asked some people, like, you know, do I need it for my collection? And they're like, you're never going to collect every knife. <laughs> So you, if you got a chance to buy a Hinura, just buy it. <laughs> okay. Okay. So enough said. I don't have one yet. <laughs> um, yeah, because I got a my I came up with the money for the other ones. I'm sure it'll happen. And that's now if it shows up on a website, because like you know, they don't just appear dramatically, they're always gone the moment they appear. So um, so with all these new blacksmiths coming out, and I, I was referring to one a minute ago. Um are there so first of all, with all the new blacksmiths coming out, any plans for Spring Hammer 3? Mm. All right. Spring Hammer 3, I'd right? love to. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. So I guess in case anybody doesn't know, we made two documentary films called Spring Hammer and Spring Hammer 2. So the first the one time. kind of looks at, you know, we, we interview all the blacksmiths we work with and, and kind of stitch it together with a bit of a story. But the, the idea is we look at the past, present, and future of blacksmithing. Right. And the second one, we look at really the nuts and bolts steps on how to make a knife. If we're going to do a third one, we'd like to. I, I want it to be about food and the end user. I want it to be about the people okay. using the knives. What's the experience using it? And especially food, obviously. Right. It's what you use the knife for. Um, Spring Hammer 3 will be tricky because my buddy Kevin Kosowin shot the first two films, but he's got a Vimeo paper pay-per-view show called from the wild where him and friends i'm on the show sometimes very rarely um but we will go they go out hunting and fishing and foraging in alberta and and beyond now but they but they go out every month and make a meal right <laughs> and the food's good and it's it's a really cool hunting and fishing program because it's not like oh i've got a fish on oh i've got a fish on it's right. it's more like like his first ice fishing video if you watch the first season they go out they drive out to the middle of a lake in a skidoo. They break the auger. Then they go back, defeated. <laughs> Day yeah. one of fishing. Well, I, right? I mean, that's real life. <laughs> right? With, but with beautiful scenery and a great score. Like, it's really touching and dramatic. And you just feel the emotions and the, and the, and the challenges of doing this, right? 
So he's busy with that, but he's also doing a new show with a buddy of mine, Paul Rogowski, who's a really great chef, and a guy named Les Stroud, who had a TV show called Survivor Man. Okay. And they're going out and doing basically the same thing without shooting. It's more foraging <clears throat> and cooking. So it seems that Les and Kevin go out foraging, collect all these cool things, Brings it back and they just go, here, Paul, cook us a meal. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Paul's left to like, oh. all these people need to free up their schedules for a week and even. And it's just hard. Out. Yeah. So it's just really hard to get him on it. But um, I've always thought, how hard can it be making a film? Well, so just so you know, my son <laughs> is going to school for cinematography. So Vancouver. Um, three ah. years ahead cinematographer is high school so if you need to just drag a kid to Japan I give my permission mm. you come in a little cheaper than your average person but we can see my work okay that my work I'll be jealous <laughs> um, <laughs> so with all are there is there a new blacksmith coming out that's like the blacksmith we haven't heard of that's just making waves um I you know I think there's two younger guys that um now and, and here's the thing I haven't met one of them even because this year has been this this like I haven't been to Japan since since October. You normally go two to three times a year or so, and you haven't even been yeah. able to go. Yeah, I'm usually there two or three times a year, and I haven't been able to go. Okay. It's weird. And there's we've uh, Naoto Naoto who works with us. I, we right. call him our cultural ambassador. Yeah. He, he does most of the Japanese buying. Now it's easier, right? He speaks English, he speaks Japanese, <laughs> so he's he's fluent language Japanese and English, and he's fluent culture Japan, Japan and, and and Canada, and he's even and he's fluent in in what I call knifeware culture. He's been with us ten years now, so he really gets what we're on about. So I can I can even send him a text with very few words, and he's like, "Yeah, I'll find that." <laughs> you know, it's funny you bring up something that a lot of people watching might not understand is that um. Japanese culture has a lot to do with not only the making of the product that they make, but the selling of the product they make and, and everything about it. Because when, like when you bow there, you know, it's not hands in front, hands inside, it's hands 45 degrees. You look at someone, you don't take your eyes off of them unless you put them above you and you take your head, head off your eyes off to say, I put you before me. Um, when you, there's no such thing as bad food. There's food you don't like, but that doesn't make it bad. Um, food that is good to say out loud, eat to like, you know, to like confirm, you know, like, oh, she, I'm sorry, oh, she, oh, she, the food is so good, you know, too. But there is a, a pride that was and responsibility to perfection. And so to know that you know, a lot of people see like these people are just hammering these things out. And I'm like, if you know knife culture, if you have an older generational person who came up the way Japan is, no. This knife wasn't just beat out and made. And so I get like some money there. Each knife has its place and my heart and perfection needed to be in this one piece before I let it go. And you're paying for that attention. Not that I hit hammered out 30 blanks today and you're one of them. I got to know each blank. I put my eye on this. And so people need to understand that uh, there are plenty of companies that stamp things. Out. Lucy. That's dog number two. This is, yeah, it's the golden retriever. And uh, so, but I just want people who know, because you sell Japanese knives. You're, you're not known for selling Western knives. No. Yeah. So, but it's, but when you go into a Japanese knife with you, you're getting more than the piece of, you're getting culture, you're getting history, you're getting dedication, you're getting an attempt at perfection and you're owning it. And you know that, and I know that, and we have a love of that. And we need to convey to people who you're buying more. And I yeah. feel that on, on the knives that I buy. So you were going to say there's two blacksmiths you haven't met and their names are? We just well, I've, there's, there's two. I've, well, there's one I've met. Now, Mizaki, Mizaki said, you'll see his knives show up at our shop now and again, especially for uh, Small Makers Month. Okay. We, here, we've got this problem, Greg. We've, we've now got six knife stores, right? <laughs> that all need inventory, but we, like over a 12 month period, we need more knives than Mizaki can actually make in a, in a year. Sure. Right? So we're, we're, we're trying to focus, we're trying to get, uh, so we started something called Small Makers Month. So it's good, it starts July, definitely... July 12 this year, right? And what we have is is these, we're, we're trying to get as many of the knives together of these small makers that, 
I think of them like asparagus. You know how asparagus comes into season in April and May and it's fantastic. And then it kind of about now in the year it pisses out and it's done, right? Because they got to let the plants grow. So it's very seasonal, right? And I think of these small makers knives at our shops like a seasonal thing. Okay. They're here and they're here as long as they can be here until the inventory holds, but but they're not going to be here probably in December. Well, I'll definitely unless, unless they send me some just in November for kicks. I'll definitely in the description of this video go on and find the blacksmith link and put a link to that particular blacksmith. Right. So here, so you asked about blacksmiths. So I got to tell you. Okay. So Mizaki, Mizaki-san in Sanjo, who I think is great. Okay. He's an interesting fella. Do, do you want me to talk about him for a bit? Because I think he's Listen, really- people cool. are wanting to know new stuff. We've all seen like, you know, your other. We're, we're looking for that inside blacksmith, Japanese, like, like you're, and you're letting us in on it. So that's, right. I don't care if people click through my damn video and don't even watch it. At the end of the day, <laughs> we're getting something new from you. You know, so I'll take it. I'll take it all. All right. Down. Well, I'll tell you what. Mizaki-san, he's killing it. He um, is from Hokkaido. Okay. Which is the North Island of Japan, right? Where they've got the wild horses and the wild wildness, right? Um, and he left there when he was 18 or 20 on a motorcycle with a tent. He put his camping gear on his bike and he cruised off through Japan. He decided he wanted to be a blacksmith. No, he decided he wanted to be a craftsman. So he tried paper making. He tried scissor making, razor making. He was in Miki. He was in Sakai. He was in Kumamoto. Um, and then he decided, I think blacksmithing, kitchen knives, I think that's what I like the best. And he landed in Sanjo and he stayed there because they have a really good program with the local government that, that supports and helps uh, finance new blacksmith businesses, right? Like cultural arts to keep it going. Yeah, something like that. But they just, because Sanjo is really, I think Sanjo is a rich area anyway, right? Because you've got companies called, you know, have you heard of Thermos? <laughs> Have yeah. you heard of Global Knives? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? So they've got so some nice they're supporting the. So they got some big companies. That, so I think, and, and, and you know what? They've got great water and rice. So the sake from Niigata, in my idea, in my mind, that area is the best sake. And, and some, of the, some of the best blacksmiths and some of the best tradesmen, uh, craftsmen. So he settled there, started work with Yoshikani, with Masashi-san, so we, we deal with, um, we don't deal with Yoshikani, you, you know that. Um, yeah. But I deal with Masashi, who's the brother okay. of the owner of Yoshikani. Brothers, right? So this is, this is what happened to Yoshikani. Uncle was the head blacksmith, and then the Yamamoto brothers, boom, boom, yeah. boom, were working underneath. One brother was older, Masashi was younger, and the older one said, let's, let's do some things to make things more mass market, make it easier for us. Yes. And Masashi said, fuck that. <laughs> I mean, uh, no thank you. <laughs> and uh, so what he did is he, he went and started his own where he said, I, I, wanna, I want to laminate my steel. I want to forge my steel. I want to anneal. I want to heat treat. I want to grind, sharpen, uh, sign, and put the handle on myself. I don't want to send it out to a different company to do these things. Yes. I want to do everything alone in this house. So he started that. I went with him. I liked his way of thinking. Masashi Hamono. Uh, sorry? That's Masashi Hamono. That's, that, yeah, it's Masashi sign. So his, his name's Yamamoto, but his brother goes by Yamamoto. So he yeah. goes by Masashi, his first name. Okay. Um, and Mizaki was working with him at the time as well. And Mizaki kind of said the same thing. He's like, you know what? I think I'll just branch out on my own where I can do all the processes myself. I don't want to farm these out. So he went off and started his own. I was there right when he first bought his own blacksmith. Masashi brought me there. He's like, oh, you got to meet this guy. He's just starting out. And honestly, I thought it was a, a, a motorcycle graveyard. He had, he, had a, uh, he had the shed that had all the blacksmithing equipment, and you could see it. But I would say 70% was motorcycle parts and motorcycles. Yeah. <laughs> and but then I thought, there was oh. no great artist in there that was trapped and waiting to get out and... Well, I just thought, what a disaster. This guy's crazy, right? And there was like, he had one knife. <laughs> He's like, I've made this. I'm like, do you have anything else? He's like, just one. I'm like, why don't I buy that one for me, for my collection, and we'll place some orders. Um, but since then, he's cleaned everything up. 
He's got another guy working on it now. It's a super efficient little joint. He's painted it all up. Like basically he just bought it from an old man. It was a junkyard and he just kind of has been slowly chipping away at it. Killer. He's making great knives. He's like Masashi. He makes knives that feel heavier. They feel like they're not going to cut properly. They feel like they're going to get really, they're going to be really fat and get wedged in a potato. And they don't because the grinding, right? Because they know what they're doing. So, so I'm just make, that we're all they here. make rugged knives. They make rugged knives that are sharp as hell. So everyone, so, everyone out, everyone watching, if you're a knife collector, you got the inside scoop, the next knife to get. Whenever Mizaki. Mizaki, cool guy, great knives. The other one is uh, Manaka-san, Kisuke Manaka. And he comes from a knife selling family. Okay. But they weren't blacksmiths. And he had a room full of blacksmithing equipment that was always kind of there, <laughs> but was never used. Okay. And he went, oh, I think I could be a blacksmith. And I was like, that was it. He's like, yeah, knife selling's fun, but I think I'm going to be a blacksmith. And then started, and uh, now he's into weird steel. So he's into ATS-34, which is kind of popular in Japan for hunting knives and stuff. Okay. He's into ZDP-189. Yeah, and he's into and something. I wrote this down group because- group of people doing that. Yeah, and there's this other one that I don't even know what it is called Vanadis. So V-A-N-A-D-I-S-4 Extra. Vanadis-4 Extra. So I know nothing about it. Pat, who knows? Naoto says it's uh, super hard. And uh, like, well, with the, you have the vanadium, you definitely did that. Yeah. So he says it's in the HAP 40 and ZDP 189 kind of department. I haven't seen one yet. Yes. He also has something called sub zero heat treating, he does, which makes the steel harder, stronger. I've heard of this reverse. Yes. I don't know anything about that, but I add. Naoto's explained it to me several times. Naoto buys textbooks from Japan. Like last time we were there, he bought a textbook about heat treating, a textbook about steel, and a textbook about forging. I can't read them. I don't read Japanese. So they're in, yeah, kanji. So he tries to give me lessons sometimes, and he's, Professor Naoto's way <laughs> smarter than me. I don't have any education. You're going off to teach metallurgy <laughs> now at university. <laughs> um, but... The, yeah, so sub zero heat treating is a big reason why his ATS-34 knives are killer mm -hmm. but he also forges so if you're looking at the blade head on he forges the spine's really thin but it gets fatter and then it gets so he's kind okay, of well, a diamond okay shape. yeah we have not seen that way stronger really clever i can't seem to chip this knife i've tried this is when we buy new knives we uh we put them through the paces and try to we try to break them essentially watch okay. some of the videos mike does on our channel yeah, I'll go terrible, the terrible things. <laughs> oh, he's <laughs> hey, we pay him for knife destruction. He's a he's shit. No, <laughs> Mike's my right hand man, but he uh, goes, well, him and I often talk about how do people break these knives so badly? How's this happen? And we go and try to do it, and we can't. So I don't know what people do, but anyway, Manak Sands uh, ATS 43 are killer. The diamond they shape. don't sit on a knife maggot properly because the because this diamond shaped form it sits on the magnet and moves around doesn't right so it's it's a it's a pain in the butt that way mine lives in a drawer with a and a sheet i saw on your website people can come in and try knives so if you sell that knife is that there's one maybe that somebody gets to see or feel or yeah so if come to shop. you know what i i like 14 years ago i realized that people would come in and they'd say I'd say, hey, these are really sharp knives. And they said, they would say things like, I've never heard of this brand. You said it might rust. You said it might chip. Oh, yeah. And it's very expensive. Mm. <laughs> so I would bring my knives in and let people try them. So now I just, we just, you know what? Each shop has about $15,000 of sample knives in it. I saw, I saw in the video right. with people going around. Yeah. It's just crazy. So we've just got, we've just got a lot of knives. So we've got at least one knife from every line. So you can come in and try it out. Um, so that's cool. I, I we even have, we, if you come to Calgary, you can even try the Hinura, a Sa, Hinura Santoku. Okay. Then I, I'll, I'll definitely um, have to try to make it there. I don't know how far Calgary is from Vancouver. About 14 hours if you're driving. Okay. <laughs> About one and a half <laughs> hours if you're on an airplane. <laughs> um, so, 
Okay, so are you as proficient at sharpening as your team? <laughs> I don't sharpen much anymore, to be honest. Yeah. I only sharpen with his cameras out now because that's what people want to see me do. Well, um, but you know what? I taught everybody eventually, I- initially. Yeah. Nautos, Nautos since passed me. But uh, you, you did a video like seven years ago or maybe longer that I saw where you actually, I've never seen this, but you were going on a core stone and then deburring before we went to the next stone. I'm not used mm. to that deburring process in between. Is that still how you guys do that? I always do. Yep. Or in between every single stone all the way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm, it makes, I'm, you know, nice. especially, especially um, so after, like after about 2000 grit, anything higher than that, I do it all by ear and by feel, right? Because yeah. I can hear when the steel changes. I can hear and feel when it's done. Okay. Right. It's just smooth. Um, it's just, it, looks, it's, it just quiets right down and smooths right out. You don't feel those little pops and dings and zings anymore. You don't hear them. And that's when you know to move on to the next one. Nice. If you're doing something powder steel that's really hard, do 20 more strokes after you get to that quiet point. <laughs> I literally that's all other people say that, like, be prepared for a workout. I've yeah, done, like if you're doing, yeah, if you're doing half 40. R2s and um, the, the camo, Shira camo one has a density and a coldness and a weight. And that was 180 millimeter Damascus. So it's other steel, but the 270 millimeter Kato, Sujihito, Kato. Kato. Sorry, I'll, I'll correct you only because no, I, you I know to, that you I want to. To make sure I learn all these I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not doing it to be a, an obnoxious asshole. No, I said earlier, I asked you to. Yeah. As I know, I, but I'm just, I'm just saying it because I feel like a rude jerk when I correct you. No, I was, um, so I just recently went to Blade Show and there was no kitchen knife people there at all it was all oh, in, in blade, atlanta yeah blade show yeah 900 vendors i interviewed 37 people a lot of the top people gave me the time of the day i was so happy that they took a moment with me and murray carter was there ah murray he's so a good guy I, I interviewed him and he was quick because to say i'm gonna do you a favor and i'm gonna it's yuto not gyoto because i was saying i got as a slur Gyoto and 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 it's Gyoto, and he was like also Murray's, listen. Murray's Murray's Japanese is very good. Well, I mean, he spent a little bit of time there. No, no, <laughs> but I've like I've spent like I, I I spent some time with him at the Seki Knife Show years ago. What was he there like seventeen years or twenty years? Yeah, I don't know. He was anyway, he just came up to me. I was the, I was like the the year that I was there. This was like probably 13, 14 years ago. But he came up to me and said, who are you? Why are you here? You're the only non-Japanese person here. What's going on? So um, hey, you we don't spent a bit of time problem. together. But listen, listen, listening to him speak Japanese with everybody around, you close your eyes. He's Japanese. He's, he's But you legit. don't carry a Murray, Murray Carter knife in your... No. Okay. No. That's fine. I, I just was pointing out that... But I didn't think that it had made the shops. Well, he he re- t- retails his knives himself, right? I do know that one guy that trained under him and uh, Ryan Swanson at District Cutlery carries that product. There. Yeah, he probably he probably knows him a bit better than I do. <laughs> okay, okay. He doesn't he doesn't wholesale knives as far as I know. He just okay. Eats, I, I, he I was aware of that. Okay, but um, I might. I listen. I could be totally wrong. I also don't focus on him because he's not Japanese in Japan. Very true. Right, so it doesn't Japanese really get our stones. brand. Sorry, people want to know about Japanese natural stones and their place in your business, and then we're you getting more it? and more. We're getting more and more into Japanese natural stones. Um, one thing I see on the forums, people always call them JNATs. I hate yeah. that. Okay. It just seems. I know it's easier to type, but it seems so disrespectful. <laughs> so Japanese natural stones. Yeah, send me an email, ask me about Japanese natural stones, I'll respond. Send me an email, ask me about J-Nats for your J-Knives, and I'll probably just delete it. <laughs> I just, there you go. I, it's, I, I, I'm, I'm, a fussy, I'm a fussy old lady sometimes. You guys were doing a live, and and um, I'm going to say his name wrong, but Nato? Now, Naoto. Naoto. So Naoto was using several different Japanese natural stones during that video. But I didn't know if that was something readily available on your site or it's just kind yeah. of hard to deal with. Because every stone has 
I own a lot of them. I, I invested the money and they actually have their each stone has their own personality. And there's no way to guarantee anything. The, 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 the grit count, which doesn't really exist is a range and people have to purchase it and feel it. And I can imagine as a retailer, it's hard to actually get something and say, we believe in this, buy it. This is our opinion of it. You have to test it. We only buy natural stones now from three sources and one of them will buy them untested. So one, we believe that we like, we trust him perfectly, but yeah. the other two, we test them ourselves. So now goes and, and sharpens stuff. So he'll bring, he'll just bring a bunch of knives. Okay. So you heard it here. Okay, they're all to the, they're tested or trusted thoroughly. We say it behind the product. If it's on our side. Yeah. yeah. That's the thing. Like a lot of people just sell things. They'll, they'll buy them and sell them. Right. Um, we, I don't think that's the way to have longevity in our business. Right. right. So we're trying to build a business that lasts hundred years. So we're, we don't, a shortcut's so you're very rarely, <laughs> you're kind of getting cooked there. Well, but a it's, shortcut's it's like very rarely the way to go, I think. Yeah. So I love my Japanese natural stones. I covet them. I like owning uh, something God made. Um, oh, yeah. But you do, you, I think you have to be proficient at sharpening, not necessarily polishing is all different beasts altogether, but I think you need to be proficient at sharpening before you move on to them. So you can when you have to get the right stone to match the right steel by the right blacksmith. People right? don't know this that. Is, this is really key. Um, do you drink wine? Do you drink wine? I mean, I have. It's not the okay. Thing I'm a big. I'm a big wino. I really. I. I've studied wine. I. I just. I'm. I'm a. I'm a colossal bore about it. But I'll try to make this really easy. Burgundy, Burgundy, okay. French in, in, from Burgundy. Uh, the red wine is generally Pinot Noir grape. And here's my theory about Burgundy. Tons of it is very, very expensive. And a lot of it that's very expensive tastes like burnt hockey pucks and strawberries and bad smells and silage. And I don't know, there's some funky stuff going on. I reckon with Burgundy, you have to drink and spend a lot of money on Burgundy until you find a good one. But when you find a good one, oh my God. God, it's good. That is, that is exactly a Japanese natural stone. <laughs> and Japanese natural stones are burgundy. So we try to do the, the hard part by only buying good ones for you. But then when there's the match, right? So I can have one stone, let's say. I've got this one stone. For example, um, Fujiwara said years ago, gave me one stone. And he said, this stone is perfect for my Shirogami knives. And I said, well, what about your Algami Super Nice? He says, no, it's not good for that one. <laughs> and he's know, right. Like, it was fine. Enough. It's fine. For the, it's fine for the Algami Super, but it's, it makes the Shirogami sing, right? But you take it and put it on a Takeda Algami Super, it's fine. You take somebody else's Shirogami, it's really good, but it doesn't, it's not the same. It's just the, the match of this blacksmith using this steel and this stone. When you find it, it's amazing. Which is okay. why we haven't really got into it in a big way before, because it was hard to give people advice on how to on, on what they wanted and what they needed, right? It's an I think more and more people are now doing like you and buying them and trying them out. It's like a hobby. It's something interesting. Well, so you have to have the we'll see to... more and more. We just can't keep them in stock. We keep buying what we think is a like a real crap load of them, and then they just they just go. Right. Well, I'm glad that people can afford that habit because it's a, it's a rabbit hole. <laughs> I mean, absolutely. It is. And it's um, just, just like I Burgundy, invested a lot of money in, in that rabbit hole myself. <laughs> but now you've got me curious because I want to sharpen all my knives on them and see which ones do better on that. You, you'll and see. So, you'll see. There's a difference, right? Because okay. I, uh, this is something I want to talk about. Actually, a lot of people seem to think, well, this knife is made with VG10 and this knife is VG10 and this knife is VG10. So they're all the same. It's easy to think that, but it still but takes it's, but it's, three. But, it, but it's, it, it, nah, it's not right though. <laughs> think about it. If you and me started with flour, water, salt, and yeast and said, make a loaf of bread, we'd make two different loaves of bread. Wait, same wait, ingredients, wait. same ingredients. We'd make two different loaves of bread, right? Two very different loaves of bread, likely. Um, and that's called craftsmanship. And that's technique, right? And that's where blacksmiths can shine 
or be good, <laughs> right? So yeah. when you were asking me earlier, what's my favorite knife steel? I'd say my favorite steel is the one that blacksmith's most happy with because <laughs> okay. he's better at it. Um, so we're going to move over to uh, guided sharpeners like Wicked Edge. Like, mm. yeah, do you sell those or you use them or you? I've never used one. I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> I'm happy to ask you. And I said that should, I would. Should we, should we send me a message? If we should, yeah. tell me which one I should have or use. I, I know someone who wants to do that. I wasn't going to mention this, but I, I, and it's not Japanese, but um, it is in the industry of something to sell. We have in America, uh, a, a, some American inventors, and I don't know if you've used diamond emulsions on your leather straps. Yeah, I've got out of it though, to be honest. <laughs> okay. There's a one that's happening right now called Gunny Juice and Scott Gunn, who's producing that out of Nebraska. And I'm sure he would send you something for free, but it's, you know, it's a high quality. Anyway, I'm not trying to plug my friend, but I just didn't know. I didn't see it on your site. I didn't know if you used it or aware of it, but. Yeah, I uh, you know what? We get really good results. <laughs> yep. Because we've, we've been at this for 14 years and we've kind of got in a groove of what we like. Every, every sharpener at our stores have, has a different <coughs> angle on it, but we all do seem to kind of settle into the same bits sure. of equipment because it just, it just works. Because we, we also want, we want really great sharp. Like, okay, number one, it has to be sharp, right? It has to be sharp. And it has to, but number two, it has to look good. Yes. Number three, it has to be quick. <laughs> yes. Right? We yeah. don't charge very much for sharpening, and we give half of our sharpening money every year away to different charities, right? Awesome. So sharpening mostly costs me money. Well, I and I agree with you that I'm getting ready to do a video on sharpening commercially to say, like, you know, to what extent do you, does the customer really require? And even though I have, you know, stones that go up to 12,000 plus, you know, am I really going to go beyond 3000 for a commercial thing? Probably not. I have leather, I have diamond emulsion on leather that stays on the leather. So if I'm stropping it all, I don't, it's not an extra step. It's already on the leather, but, um, but yeah, for me to hit a, you know, a, a coarse grid, if it's really dull, a thousand or 3000 call it a day, I have great technique. So they're going to get an amazing knife, but they don't need a mirror polish, nor do they, they, they don't want scratches in it either. That will deface it. So Kasumi, you know, finish, here you go. It's sharper than it, than it was when you bought it. And they're super happy. And, and, and like you said, it keeps the price down. So I get that. Um, so do we know about the impact of COVID and it's a pact on like shortages of steel and maybe prices going up on knives? Are we seeing that happening? Yeah. <laughs> Not yeah. Really. Uh, all consumer I goods have been hit pretty hard. Um, have you tried to build anything with wood recently? <laughs> uh, so I have, you don't see it. I, I have a dining room table that I just got my eight wooden chairs for my table that seats 10. There was a price quote and there was a price I paid and there was a difference between the delivery and how long it took to get them. So I'm very aware of the impact of wood currently but i didn't and i know steel and glue i mean composite board the, the glue that holds the composite together everything there's a shortage of so i'm assuming that even though hitachi's in japan and that steel is made there and they can go grab their hitachi and do their thing there there's still a shortage of people because they weren't going to factories because of covid because they were scared so there's less hitachi steel so then the prices might be going up and we're going to start seeing the effects of that yeah, like, like for example, ta like I don't know what Hitachi did. I don't know what happened with them, but I do know with Takavu Specialty Steels, they shut for a, a period. And I know when they shut, it takes days to ramp it back up. And uh, so you're, yeah, you're going to see, you're going to see shortages. I'm, I'm sure it'll work itself out yeah. eventually. <laughs> like I, I think what happened is a lot of consumer goods people were more interested in buying because they're stuck at home watching tv and bored right and they were cooking so they wanted a knife because they weren't going on airplanes they weren't going to hotels they weren't going to restaurants and this is like worldwide right so i think a lot of people had just spare money but i think now that 
vacations are back on the on the menu. I, I think that's going to help things. I think that's going to help things sort out, right? You would love it here. We have two thousand restaurants that are open. They're packed every day. Um, <laughs> ah, they're really packed every day. I cook good food in my backyard. <laughs> hey, yes, you do. I've seen your food. Um, so. I, I, other questions were about like, were you ever going to get Western knives? But we already no. kind of the answer. Well, that. yes and no. We have a we have a brand called Kent of Inglewood. So we've got this other store. Right. We do uh, men's grooming stuff. So straight razors, safety razors, shaving brushes, you know, bombs and lotions, that sort of thing, like men's grooming stuff. But we also have the outdoor side of it, which is the axes, pocket knives, folding knives, um, uh, fixed blade knives. Yep things like that. And we're getting more Canadian blacksmiths in there and we're getting some American made uh, pocket knives, like folding knives as well. And I definitely We've got some American axes in there. And I just recently learned because in my store for the t-shirts, I thought I'm launching this weekend. Yay. I got to plug myself. Um, I had a lot of, I did not have a Canadian knives matter shirt. I'm thinking I'm going to make one because I'm learning that there are some Canadian blacksmiths that are making waves and um, people are telling me about them. So I'm like, I've got to make a shirt to give a shout out to, to the Canadian artist. What's well, interesting. Yeah. So we carry Chris Green, who's an old chef buddy of mine. Okay. Through all the chefing and then the baking, threw the garbage and then went to school for archaeology, threw that in the garbage. <laughs> and now, and now he makes, now he's a blacksmith. He makes great knives because he understands too about what a, like what craftsmanship is from, Especially yeah, okay. his baking career, right? Because I know it's different mm -hmm. materials, but it's not vastly a different job. <laughs> it's still it's still a, a learned trait. It takes trial and it is right. But yep. and but he uh yeah, he, I think second careers are often really good for people. And I think Chris managed to learn very quickly. Um so yeah, we carry his knives. We um I just actually the Canadian I just knife, knife, knife maker that you carry his knives. Yeah. His name is Chris Green. That's Those in the, the Kent of Inglewood, Inglewood or that's Kent, in the yeah at the Kent of Inglewood stores. And we've got um, I just bought a, a knife from a guy in Nova Scotia in Canada called uh, Nick Skinner. I just had him make me a custom knife. And he worked for you. Nick used to work for us. Yeah, I knew but that. Nick I followed is, him on Facebook. Yeah, shit. So he <clears throat> he builds rifles. He's a blacksmith. He does all this crazy. I, didn't, stuff. I know he became a blacksmith, so that's awesome. I'm glad he's, he's, he's been, been doing it for years. He just didn't he know that we were gift of Inglewood brain. Yeah. 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 It was a huge score for him to come in because he comes Amazing. in he knows like he, he gets axes. He's a blacksmith. <laughs> he, so it was such a great uh, fit for us. He's moved back to Nova Scotia. I just got him to make me a knife. It's gorgeous. So he's made me a, a fixed blade camping knife and uh, it's just, it's a beauty, man. I can't, I can't wait. Well, I know that you had plans to open up a store in Japan. That was something you wrote about. Mm, I'd like to, yeah. Okay, so I still have to open a store in Toronto. <laughs> yes. Toronto, you might have heard of it. It's a, it's a very well, large so, city. Believe it or not. <laughs> so when I trained at Vidal Sassoon, I trained twice in Toronto for a week each time. Right. So that's the city I actually kind of know my way around um, to go down to eat Chinese food on Queen Street in Spadina. I love Peking duck. So if I get a chance to do that, that's my thing. And uh, I stayed up on the, the very posh uh, end of town. And um, so that's been out so soon as way up in the Yorkville area. Yeah. And I would stay at the, uh, across from the Four Seasons is a great hotel that changes names all the time, the Grand Bay or Park Plaza. But uh, it was a nice place, to, nice place to spend a week. So yeah, I can see you up in the Yorkville area or down at Queen and Spadina near Chinatown in the Asian area. I could, you, you could do all of that. Or Eaton Center. Well, maybe, you know, who knows? I mean, there's a lot of angles there. Who knows? There's, it's been on our radar for a long time. I get that we're a big brand in Canada and we should have a store in Toronto because it is really Canada's big city. I get it, right? Are you we, just in got, we just haven't got there yet. Sorry? Are you in Quebec, though? Montreal? Mm, I would love Montreal, but the problem with Quebec is it's, it, it creates a lot of difficulties. There's a lot of language laws in Quebec. So if we opened a Quebec store, you have to have all French. I would need I would need my I would need two websites, an English and a French. Yeah, they would need to be equal in density, right? So if, right. if we have this many words in English, I need this many words in French. Wow. Yeah. So signage. If I had signs in the shop, 
everything has to be French. I knew English. that was, I thought that was as it is now. Canada, my packaging, but... as it is now, my packaging is mostly in Japanese. So I'd have to get the packaging in Japanese, obviously, that it comes French in, and then, in and then French. The English doesn't matter. Okay. Yeah, not to them. <laughs> not to them. Get the fuck out of here. We don't want English. We don't want in. The but even if I had signs print. in the store, even if I had signs in the store, I would need more French signs, and they would have to be in a larger font than the English signs. So no, no plans then. I, I see that. And I'd also need a French accountant to just do... Um, just wow. do that because it's a, that's a requirement and I would need a French lawyer as well. So there's, there's hurdles, right? <laughs> so if we're going to go into Quebec, it's almost like going to a separate country and I'm not against it. I'd love to have a Montreal <clears throat> store, man. Do you have any idea if you've been to Montreal? It is a cool city. It's Europe in I, North I, America. I, I, yeah. It's awesome. Montreal and Quebec are <laughs> a totally different world. Great cities. Um, mm -hmm. But it's gonna. I'm gonna have to like yeah. get my courage <laughs> and, and 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 go. You know, it's gonna it's gonna have to be a, a move. And uh, I still want a place in Japan. It's still on the books. Well, all right. So that concluded the first half of the interview. We'll have more next week. So please check back. Hopefully that was not a dull moment. We appreciate you so much. Have a blessed week. <laughs>